wonder why fund managers can't beat the S&P 500? Because they're sheep. And sheep get slaughtered. The numbers told the story they always do. Money never sleeps, pal. Because all we care about is getting fucking rich. You connect points I don't even know to look for. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. Public's out there throwing darts at a board, sport. I don't throw darts at a board. I bet on sure things. Welcome, Karma Nation. Week 10 is in the books. Uh, This is the Sports Trading Desk podcast uh, with your co-host, Brett Matthew, uh, and my fellow colleague and cousin, Zach James. Corey is off for the week. Uh, It was another frustrating uh, week um, coming off actually three, four, five consecutive um, plus money weeks across our portfolios. We're taking a step back this week. So we close one, three, and one uh, with a tough push on Washington. Uh, We got them at the plus three. Uh, It was at plus four, plus three and a half. Ended up closing plus two and a half. So didn't get the worst of it. Uh, Washington makes a big comeback in the second half. We're close to winning it, possibly going into OT. uh, But Matt Prater and the Lions kick a 60-yard field goal with just a few seconds left uh, to get the three-point win. So it goes into a push. So that uh, we, we miss an otherwise probably leaning into a win there. Uh, Bills was our other winner at uh, plus three. Uh, If you got a bad line there, that would have been another loss. That would have been brutal. Uh, And then we had the Bears, which uh, Bears, uh, all we were expecting was a great defensive performance, which we got. Uh, A somewhat muted offensive performance of the Vikings, which we got. And all we really needed was at least one offensive touchdown from the Bears, which they've been able to materialize in every game this season. And with the new offensive coordinator, Bill Lazor, this week, we thought that that would be at least a minor upgrade over Nagy, and we were wrong. Because the Bears, for the first time this season, don't score an offensive touchdown, uh, lose the game by six, don't cover the three. They had the lead there for a bit, at 13 to 10 in the, to the second half, uh, but couldn't pull it out. So that was another loss. Ravens minus six and a half was a game that we slid into this portfolio. We don't often do this, but so we, we put that pick into the portfolio very early on in the week. So I think we did it Sunday night or, or Monday morning with the expectation that this line was probably going to move up. And over the course of the week, uh, we did start to lose conviction on this game, especially as the line actually didn't move very materially. Moved from six and a half to seven, like we expected. Briefly moved to seven and a half and was immediately bought back down to seven. And by close, it was right back to six and a half. So I uh, thought we were going to get a little bit of closing line value there. Didn't. So we were wrong there. And then, as I mentioned, over the course of the week, we started to lose conviction on this game meaningfully to the extent where we actually didn't even have Ravens in our Super Contest or Circa Picks uh, th- this week uh, for a variety of reasons, but mostly just the, the loss of conviction. Uh, and then our, our final pick was Chargers, just was a, a flat-out loser, weren't really competitive in that, turnovers, definitely hurt them. Everything continues to go kind of Miami's way. Don't really, not a lot being asked necessarily of Tua, but he's also not committing a ton of mistakes. So you got to give him uh, uh, that. And, but that defense just continues to play uh, really well, keep them in games and, and even is scoring points for them. Uh, so we end the week one, three, and one super contest con- consensus plays our benchmark. Uh, closes the week going three, one, and one. So losing a little bit of relative performance there, but still outperforming the benchmark on the season, uh, which we're excited about. 
Um, so, so where does that put us for, for the season, Zach, both in core uh, and in aggressive? Yeah, in core, so we're basically, we're 27, 21, and three, um, and plus almost six units in core. And mind you, in core, you know, we're only risking, you know, 1%, one unit, however you want to phrase it, um, basically per game, five games a week. So, you know, minimal risk. So if you have a low risk appetite and if you were scaling this to, you know, let's say you had the bankroll to do 10,000 per game, you know, obviously being up five units is, you know, a nice chunk of change at 50K. So, you know, it's all relative to your, you know, bankroll uh, more or less. And an aggressive, you know, we're up, um, we were up small amount this week, um, had some nice live plays and whatnot. So we're up almost 10 units on the season and aggressive and aggressive is going to be more volatile because we take on more risk. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, we can wager up to 15 to 20% on a, on a high week. Generally it's about 10 to 12, uh, units. Um, but yeah, that's about where we're at. Yeah, and one of the benefits of aggressive, and this again comes down to the benefits that uh, the Bet Karma premium sp- subscribers get, is you get access to our live trades over the course of the Sunday or Monday night games, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why we can actually all and we often do outperform core uh, because you know we definitely feel like we have an edge when trading these games live as the prices can kind of get all out of whack and what we believe we can capitalize on some of this mispriced risk in the games. Uh, And we've been able to do that over the last several weeks and over the course of the season. And that's one of the reasons why you can see, you know, core isn't up in between the range of five, six units, but you see ag up, you know, in excess of 10 units uh, right now. And that a lot of that comes uh, directly attributable uh, to that live trading, uh, which again, you get access to, you can see those trades as they're coming through, as we're posting them, uh, if you're a member of the Bet Karma Premium subscribe uh, uh, package. So uh, definitely feel free to, to jump up on that to get access to that. So let's go ahead and uh, move on to week 11. Uh, so Zach, uh, so tonight's the, the Seattle Cardinals game. Uh, didn't have a strong view on that one. I think we kind of all leaned Seattle. Um, I didn't have a strong view on that one, but it's going to, by the time you hear that, it's going to be in the rear view mirror. Uh, so let's move on to the next game. So it's Eagles at the Browns. Uh, looking at uh, minus three Browns right now. So what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, well, I guess rumor had it is, you know, there was an initial perception that the weather was going to be bad again, but I don't think that's the case here. Um, What's weird to me is this line is the same as it was last week versus the Texans. Um, You know, once the line moved from three to three and a half, four, I started to lean Texans, even had it in the karma pick. And part of the reason is, is, you know, Browns, I'm not sure they're, they're very dynamic of a team right now. Um, Baker has just not been very good this season. And the Eagles, though they've been disappointing in large <laughs> portions of the season, they definitely have a better defense, especially against the run, than what the Texans have. And I know the Eagles struggled last week versus the Giants a little bit, but I think that can be tossed up to the team having, what, one game over the last month? And at first, I think the initial kind of like, perception was to think well they had all this time to get their players healthy which i think is partially true but what's also probably more true is they lost all rhythm and it's and it's a lot of new players coming back right because they were hurt so i think in this game this is where the the net benefit of players are now healthy we're able to rest and now they're getting more in sync again because they just played a game is more likely to come to pass than it was last week versus the Giants. So in a sense, I don't see how the Browns are minus three this week versus the Eagles and how they were minus three last week versus the Texans. Like something, something is off. And obviously last week they only beat the Texans by three in the end. So I lean Eagles, even though I don't like Eagles, even though I think Giants are going to win the division, but I don't see 
the kind of like sure footedness of taking the Browns in the spot. So if you're giving me plus three, I think that's where I'm going to lean. So once I do more research, uh, I will kind of want to see if I kind of shift because I know there's some COVID stuff going around with the Eagles uh, second string receivers, but um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm leaning right now. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, COVID affects all teams and can affect them at any point in time. And uh, so I'm looking at some of the headlines here within the last 24 hours. So Brown's right tackle, Jack Conklin, one of their best offensive linemen. He's on the COVID list right now, as is kicker Cody Parkey, long snapper, um, Charlie Hewlett as well. Um, So Brown's hurting from that perspective as well. I think Conklin would especially be a big loss. Parkey's not a great kicker, so that I suspect they should probably be able to find some sort of suitable replacement, even if last minute. Uh, but Conklin would definitely be a notable loss in this. And the thing is, when it comes to betting the Eagles, I mean, the Eagles, the market is is just not getting off the Eagles. No matter how many times they disappoint and lose flat out, uh, you're just not getting any added value. On them because you're not getting any 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 added value here. I mean, I think one of the reasons last week why we were a little bit hesitant on Browns Texans, especially as the line kept getting kicked around, was I thought you had a really great comp for that game, which was two weeks ago now the Chargers Raiders, which eventually came down to the last play. And if you bet the Chargers, you would have thought you know you were vindicated that they should have won and covered. And they, and uh, and if if you, if we were betting the Raiders, that you also should have covered, and uh, you know it's going to come down to a final game, to a final play, and so really, is there any edge? And then this is the same, this is the same factor. And, and again, like that's how Texans Browns played out. This is Eagles Browns. I mean, I, I don't think this game is bettable at this point in time. Not not at three. If you can't. These are two teams you can't trust. You can't trust the Browns. You can't trust the Eagles. The Eagles, I feel like over the course of the season, say, oh, they should play well this game. Oh, they should win this game. And they don't. In fact, they underperform expectations dramatically over and over and over and over again. When's the last have we seen at all this year an expectation for an Eagles game and they exceed expectations. Have we seen that? No, I don't think so. And so, They've, uh, and, and like, but so I, there's got to be a component of here a buy low maybe on the Eagles. But the thing is, is the price hasn't moved on the Eagles. So are you buying low? Or are you just, you're buying at the same price. It's just the fundamentals keep like, uh, you know, getting moved up, up and down, up and down. But the performance on the field keeps drifting lower and lower and lower. I mean, even in that Giants game, I mean, the Giants led the entire way and had a pretty comfortable lead for the most part. Uh, You know, Eagles got to within four a little bit, but as soon as the Eagles got to within a a somewhat of a close margin, then the Giants would extend it. Um, You know, and... Uh, you just you what Carson Wentz is is not having a great season. Neither is Baker Mayfield. Browns are getting healthier. So are the Eagles. So it, it, this is like a super tough one. I feel like this one's just best to avoid. See how these two capricious teams play this game out. Maybe you can get some semblance of a signal moving forward but this could easily be 27 to 24 and you know we're like right back to where we start yeah i mean that's a fair point i think uh i'd have to get find a different edge in this game um but yeah based on how the eagles offense played last week versus the giants you know there's not a lot to like there um but yeah all right falcons at saints falcons plus four uh, I see a lot of betters out there uh, infatuated with the 
arrival of Jameis Winston at quarterback for the Saints. Um, you know, super excited that uh, there's going to be this capacity to throw down fields, fully leverage the Saints' offensive weapons as if Drew Brees wasn't doing that, uh, as if the Saints had been struggling offensively, had been struggling as a team, um, that they're out of the playoff race, and now the savior Jameis Winston is coming to the table. I feel like this narrative is like completely wacky and that I'd much rather have Drew Brees. Jameis Winston is not a one point downgrade. It is much more than that because it, the, the, the scale of variance explodes because now you have the capacity to throw four touchdowns, two 50 yarders to Michael Thomas. Now these are great things for fantasy, but then you could also get three picks. Two of them return for touchdowns and you lose. Jameis Winston might be able to get the full extent of this offense rolling, but he has not ever proved that he has the acumen or uh, self-restraint to not commit egregious errors repeatedly, habitually, to the point where it compromises the efficacy of that offense and ultimately the team's success for winning the game. And, yeah, and, if you, and I want to add... By no means pounding the table on the Saints on this one. No, no. And, and actually, I lean Falcons even when Breeze was healthy. And part of the reason here is because, one, it's obviously a division game, blah, blah, blah. Um, the other part is, you know, Saints are at home. Well, who cares? Their, their home field is non existent. It's a dome game. Atlanta plays in a dome. So, I mean, there's no home field advantage in this game, like, at all. Um, and these teams typically play each other tough, even when Atlanta's bad. Like, um, you know, the last couple of years, Saints have been good and up, and, you know, Falcons have kind of struggled. It doesn't matter. And coming off the bye, the last two years, Falcons have honestly dominated their com- opponents. Well, I now, think the Falcons, what, they're 3-1 and one since Rom took over. And they should be 4-0 oh, with that Lions right. blunder that never should have happened. I don't even know how it happened. So, honestly, I'm not so sure in this particular spot. Like, this game means more to Atlanta. Like, Atlanta could no – one, no one's going to talk about this. Atlanta can make the playoffs. There's, I think, is there eight playoff spots now? I think I heard someone say that. I'm it's, not. I haven't double checked. It's a possibility. If games, get I mean, with, with the COVID outbreaks, yeah, if, with with the COVID outbreaks around the country, like it only takes that one team to like just thirty players have COVID and they just gotta fucking cancel the game. So I could still see that happening. Absolutely. Falcons can make a run. Falcons can make the run and make the playoffs if they win this game. I mean, they still have to play the Chiefs, still have to play the Bucks, still have to play the Saints again. Um, so they have a tough, tough schedule. But, you know, I mean, who are they competing with for that final playoff spot? Mm-hmm. I mean, Arizona has to play the Rams two more two times. So if, if Arizona lose tonight, which they're losing right now in the four, third quarter, um, you know, they could lose four out of the last five games. So – I just think Atlanta is trending in the right direction, kind of like Minnesota. And we thought from the beginning of the year, um, sorry, Atlanta was a potential 9-10 win team that sneaks yeah. their way into the playoffs. Yeah. So they have the talent. They have the ability. They obviously have, have proven better in leadership that can score points. Um, yeah, so I, I have no problem backing the Falcons here. And if you want to take the Falcons' money line, I think that's part of the cap is especially playing Jameis Winston, like either Saints like don't miss a step and just like kind of dominate the game and the points won't matter, or like Falcons win straight up. Like Winston and Winston. I think, I think you're right. Falcons win this game straight up. Yeah. So that's, that's that's kind of my play. I mean, obviously anything can happen, but I think that's the I like the history of this rivalry and mm-hmm. the extra time to prepare and remember Raheem Morris Last year was, uh, you know, defense coordinator when 
they played at the end of the season and Jameis Winston ended the game with a pick six when he played for Tampa. So his yeah. final play as a Buccaneer. Yeah, I, I think Falcons do win this straight up. Um, I think it get, what gives me conviction is the market's conviction that Jameis Winston is like this sneaky upgrade for the Saints and that he's actually going to make them better. I mean, again, they might score more points, but they're going to lose more games. At what cost, yeah. 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 Um, and it's such a stark contrast to what Drew Brees is. And even when Drew Brees went down last year, Teddy Bridgewater was that calm, collected, game manager, you know, doesn't make mistakes. Mm-hmm. He's not going to lose the game for you. He might not they're win actually, the game for you. They're actually he's not gonna lose it for you. In that sense, they're kind of opposites. Oh, they're like, total opposites. And I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, uh, you know, PFF out there, oh, the league's racist for giving Jameis Winston a one-year, $1 million contract. The dude is, is explosive on offense, no doubt. But he's such a massive liability that, I mean, again, he threw 30 touchdowns. Amazing. He threw 30 picks. That's insane. That's insane. That's two a game. <laughs> I, that's, that's actually, like, historically bad. I think it is, right? Yeah, Isn't it I mean, historically he threw bad? seven touchdowns last year to the opposite team. So that's, that's when that's you're bad. looking at the points for and points against. Literally, one player is responsible for more than 40 points on the other side. Uh, that's almost half the games he played in. He gave the other team a touchdown. Yes. And so, like, uh, oh, it's yeah, just – That's a lot. He, that's why there's so many people that get so absorbed with the highlight reel plays from him from an offensive perspective – uh, from the actual scoring points perspective, that they get lulled to sleep as if Jameis Winston is a full-time superstar quarterback, and he's not. Yeah. The the, the cost is just too high, and that is one of the reasons why he got a one-year, one million dollar contract with the Saints. Now it's not that. I don't think that he can still win games because, again, like, he does have talent. He's got the physical, raw talent. The thing is, he's an idiot. So, like, he cannot process and make decisions and cannot learn from his mistakes. I mean, he's now been in the, the league for five, six years, and he's making bonehead rookie mistakes every year. You don't throw – 30 picks in your fifth fifth year league. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, that's like, that's pretty bad. Yeah. All right. So Falcons is the pick. (laughs) Uh, Patriots at (laughs) Falcons. Uh, Patriots sitting at one and a half, two-ish right now on the road versus Texans. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think this line is flipped if I'm not if I'm correct, which isn't a huge deal because it's only, you know, it's basically a pick more or less. Um, you know, the Texans had one of the worst coaches in the NFL, and now the replacement I'm not sure is any better. So, like, Texans are what they are, which is just not a very good team. And part of it starts with Deshaun Watson. He's not that good right now. And, like, we know he's got the talent. We know he's capable. But, you know, he's got new players. He lost the best receiver in the NFL, DeAndre Hopkins. They don't really have a running game. They don't – their offensive line's not very good. So, like, you know, Watson's got a lot to deal with. I mean, the coaching's terrible. So, like, it's just like the odds are stacked against him. And we've seen this before with lesser QBs like Jared Goff when his rookie season when um, Jared uh, Fisher was his head coach. The offense had like 13 points a game for the season. Next season, Sean McVay comes in, has 32 points a game, highest in the NFL, biggest turnaround ever. Jared Goff's the same quarterback. He's he's awful under pressure. He's Nathan Peterman under pressure. But when he has time, he has good coaching. 
he sometimes looks like a Tom Brady. He just can't think for himself. Yeah. So with Watson, I think we're in a similar situation from a team standpoint. This is that Rams t- team, like more or less in that Watson just doesn't, he's got a couple of receivers, but like coaching's bad, scheme's bad, no running game, doesn't have good blocking. Like, so he's not, he's not that good this year. He just isn't. Well, and the thing I, is with Watson and like, I, you know, I feel like the, the old line does get somewhat of a bad rap because of Watson. Not necessarily because true. of the whole line. And this goes somewhat towards what I was talking about with Winston is, I mean, Watson is a poor man's Patrick Mahomes. And, like, he can have these highlight real plays, and he's got the physical tools. And I just feel like we see this type of thing throughout the league, really, you know, kind of over and over, is you'll have athletes who have the raw physical skill set to do something, but it's very rare that you see that complemented by intellect, acumen, understanding of the game, this evolution and growth and maturation of decision-making over time. That's something that we see in someone like Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes, where they have actually these raw physical skill set to do something complemented by the engine, the machine, you know, the, the computer inside you to actually execute that, that prowess uh, in the game. And, you know, that's something we, I feel like we don't see in someone like Watson. The dude, I, he's not improved over the last yeah. two, three years. He still hangs on to the ball too long. Uh, he, you know, uh, he needs a guy like Hopkins to bail him out. And now that he doesn't have someone like him anymore, that's one of the reasons why I think that maybe, you know, people say like, oh, well, Watts isn't having that as good of a season. Like, well, it's because he doesn't have a, 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 an all-star, Pro Bowl, elite wide receiver to bail him out. Uh, and, and that's why this team is what two and seven, and the only two games they won is versus the Jaguars. Oof, and then, of yeah. course, complimented, and, and he's not getting any help from the coaching staff. That's for sure as well. So I'll definitely put some no. or the or the uh, defense. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's a combination of everything. I think, and to your point, I mean, remember who his coach was—the guy who traded DeAndre Hopkins <laughs> for the scrub running back. Like, well, I don't. No one ever understands that. So I, th- I think Watson is what he is, a no-growth quarterback since his rookie year because of the institution he's in. Just no – he doesn't have the, the coaching, the scheme around him to help him really learn how to play the position better. So, yeah. you know, hopefully they get someone in like Joe Brady or something from Panthers next year. I think that would help. Um, really like the Texans in that next year if that happened. Um, so this, yeah. is re- this is really going to come down to, you know, this, this coaching edge. And, I mean, are the Patriots on an upswing? I want to say yes, because – so th- this is the problem. Everyone is focused on what happened with the Jets. But Jets have slowly improved over the season, especially when they got their receivers healthy with – I think they have top ten receiver crew in Mims, Perriman, and Crowder – kind of secretly no one wants to talk about it but they have a dynamic dynamic three wide receivers right there if they're all playing and healthy joe flacco is still joe flacco like he can throw the ball like when well, he's getting more comfortable he's and and he even admitted he's like well i finally understand the offense once he got that second or third start so you have a veteran qb who actually might be bailing out adam gase and if you look at this has happened before look at Tannehill when he played for the dolphins you know, people want to make the joke that Adam Gase held Tannehill back. Maybe Tannehill propelled Adam Gase forward. So you could look at either way. Maybe Flacco, because he's a veteran, because he gets what maybe Adam Gase is putting down, but he can't quite explain it right. Like, oh, okay, I get what you're trying to say, coach. You suck, but uh, I, I know what to do. I'm a quarterback. I've been in the league for 15 years. So can Flacco take advantage? Sure. 
So I don't I, – I discount the whole narrative of, uh, Patriots suck, suck, suck. Yeah, their defense is not very good. They just don't have a lot of talent. Cam is, is still getting his feet under him from the COVID scare. So, you know, I, I think this team's coming around. And in this spot, you're getting Bill Belichick. Man, they can't – Texas can't stop the run. What, what, what do the Patriots want to do? What's the one thing they can do? Run the ball. Like that's – so I just – there's no way to me you could take Texans in this spot. Like you're basically saying, let's buy something that hasn't happened all season, which is Texans like putting a game together against a team that's not the Jaguars. <laughs> yeah, um, or just winning a game. Or just that's and that's what I mean, winning a game that's not against the Jaguars. So I'm just not going to buy that. If anything, I think Patriots is the play. Teasing the Patriots sounds pretty good too. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's a, it's an old coach, Romeo Cornell. I I just don't see much. To, to love in, in the Texans. No, I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely Patriots because at least with Patriots, I mean, the Texans have enough vulnerability for an astute team like the Patriots to take advantage of it, to squeak by and get that win, even if the there's a talent mismatch. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I definitely strongly lean Patriots here. I think the Texans is is definitely uh, a no bet for sure. And Patriots was definitely the buy low spot was definitely last week off that miserable Jets kind of performance. But I definitely agree with you. The, 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 and with the Jets, just a quick side, side comment is, you know, we talked about uh, over the course of the season, can't bet the Jets, can't bet the Jets. And the thing, but the thing is, is, we did start to say like what you want to see is a competitive game. When you see a competitive game from the jets, that's when you can start to consider them. And we got that versus the bills, you know? So in fact, they're winning that game, you know, by, you know, I think it was like a touchdown or more and still covered that game. And I'm really disappointed because, you know, we flirted heavily with betting the Jets for the first time all season in that game, but we thought it might be just a tad too cute. Uh, and, and then, again, they played somewhat competitively versus the Chiefs. Um, you know, we're, we're within, you know, three, four points for half that game into halftime. Uh, and then, you know, we're trouncing the Patriots for most of the game. Um, and then, of course, you know, coaching edge proves pivotal down the stretch. Um but the Jets have, are a slightly better team over the last three or four weeks, and to your point, especially as that wide receiver core has gotten healthy. Uh, last week, or a couple of weeks versus the Patriots, that was the first time all season that they've had a healthy wide receiver set. So You're actually, real, real quick, talking about the Jets right now is really making me like the Jets versus the, the Chargers this week, by the way. Yeah, to so the point where. So Jets, Jets. Jets is plus 10 right that's now. That's insane. It's, it, it's, uh, we're going to bet the Jets. I don't care because that's insane. It's, it's kind of, you know, it, it reminds me of, but there's more context as to why last year was when the Jets were plus 23 versus the Patriots week three or whatever it was. Like, it was just such a ridiculous line that we took the Jets. And we got, you know, bailed out in the end with a Stidham touchdown <laughs> interception, interception for a touchdown randomly like you didn't even need to do that because they were crushing um but hey this to me is similar in that you know let's talk about the chargers real quick chargers traveled across the country okay everyone knows that now they have to come all the way back home are they a little worn out are they really taking the jets seriously is there some anthony lynn is on his way out kind of like reality starting to set in because it's got to be the the guy's got to be done team's got to know that Jets, on the other hand, they've already known Adam Gase is done. They, like, like the whole, like, remember, there's ebb and flows, human psychology, and as it applies to sports, et cetera. The Jets have known Adam Gase is done since week four. So it's all, the bottom is already bottomed out. That's why the Jets have improved. Because now we, we're not just going to, like, shit on Adam Gase. Like, remember, is anyone even talking shit about Adam Gase right now? No, because we've already, sh- we've already thrown yeah, all the, the shit we can at him. We, it's done. He's, he's done. They're not going to, they maybe win one or two games. The season's over. We get it. 
So what does that do? It takes away pressure. It takes away conflict. It takes away – now we just play football. They're all professional athletes. Now Joe Flacco just goes out and throws three fucking touchdowns. Like, it, it's not a big deal. Whereas, I think the Chargers – I think the Chargers might start – so you might start seeing cracks in the team chemistry because I eh, still got a rookie quarterback. Fuck that guy. You know, like, uh, we're not performing as we should. Like I wouldn't be surprised if jets get their first win this week. So, and, and I'm not just saying that because like, Oh, I'm going to say that every week. I haven't said that all season. <laughs> I think, I think this could be the week. And that's why like the plus 10 to me, astronomical, stupid. It's just stupid. It should be, it should be six max, probably three to th- probably four. Three and a half, four, I would say, in a normal season, if Jets weren't historically bad, quote unquote, I would say, you know, Chargers minus four and a half to six is probably right. Well, the but, thing that I like about this is because the Jets have obviously not been upgraded by the market. No. Because they're still double digit underdogs versus a two and seven team. Um, and granted, the Chargers are better than what you'd think a two, two and seven team might be. But first of all, the Chargers are worse now than they were. Four, work four weeks ago uh, because they're offloading talent. They're also banged up and hurt. Uh, they got no running game to speak of right now. Their offensive line is banged up. Uh, you know, their, their defense is banged up and also trading away their stars. Uh, Chargers is a team. I think, especially if they get a, a new modern young coach next year, big buy on team. I, I feel like. Um, because especially if they get a healthy defense back next year, uh, that could be meaningful. Um, but yeah, in this game, I mean, I don't know if I would say it should be three, four, but yeah, six, five, six and a half, seven ish. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I think seven, still, seven still, should still be moving top. across I the country, but I think Jets had a had a buy, so not not to, uh-huh. if you're going to travel across the country, not a bad time to do it. And, and something to add, I have two things to add. Jets tasted victory. They know they should have won that game. So it's the first game, and it's important for a team like the Jets. It's the first game that they go into that locker room and they're pissed that they lost because they know they should have won it, which, which gives them a kind of like, we can win. Like, before there are doubts, now they know we can win. So they're going into this game to win it. They're not good. <laughs> they do not want to go in 16. Nobody does. That's that's so embarrassing. Forget the money. It's so embarrassing. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, <laughs> and another thing I want to add, and this is super left field, but hey, it's how I operate. Justin Herbert got his haircut this week. The dude had a nice do before that that haircut. And I'm not trying to. Dog I got the him Justin, because... the old Justin Herbert do going on right now. The COVID, so, so post COVID, no haircut. <laughs> yeah, I haven't got a haircut since March. I look like fucking like a 1980s baseball player. Um, <laughs> So Herbert getting that haircut, that tells me something very simply, right? Which is they're trying to change things. Like he's trying to shift the momentum. Like, you know, it's kind of like keep your hair long when you're trying to keep up momentum and cut it all off when you're trying to switch momentum. Like, I think it's legitimately like a terrible attempt at trying to like, I don't know, change how things are going. Yeah. And I think that can point to some like ill feelings happening in the locker room right so it's kind of like i need to do something to shake me and my team up so like i'm just gonna go all in and do something crazy like that to me is the signal it's painting so it confirms what i suspect which is the locker room is probably nearing a breaking point And so I'm not so sure they really care to even focus on the Jets, especially because the Jets are a bad team. Like, I just don't – I don't see a motivation of, like, we're not going to make the playoffs. Like, half the players got to be thinking to themselves, well, I'm not going to be here next year. Like, I'm just playing for me now. You know, like, so the whole team buy-in, they don't buy into the coach, still got a rookie QB who maybe he's good, maybe he's not. Like, this could be a breaking point. And – I just wanted to throw that hair comment because I know no handicapper is going to truly point that out other than me. So you're welcome. Yeah, great stuff. Um, <laughs> all right. So let's move on. Let's do Cowboys Vikings Cowboys plus seven on the road versus the Vikings. I mean, this is the market has been all over on the Vikings this year. Um, 
too high, oh. too low, too high, too low, keeps getting kicked around. This is probably, this is the highest that I've seen the bike is I mean, being a touchdown favorite. I don't care versus who, I don't care if they're at home. Um, is this Cowboys hey. off a of buy? Put in a admirable performance versus the Steelers, show that they aren't at least giving up. Is this an opportunity to buy the Cowboys? Yes. So it's uncomfortable, but I don't think you can take the Vikings here. And the main reason is, you know, Vikings are only having, what, five days to prepare, prepare for the Cowboys now? Cowboys had two, almost two weeks to prepare for the Vikings. And not just prepare for the Vikings, but, like, figure out who their quarterback is. Figure out how to get their offense back on track. Figure out how to stabilize their defense just to, like – and, again, the good thing about playing the Vikings is can you really just stop Dalvin Cook? Like, that's the key. If you stop Dalvin Cook, you got a chance. As we saw with the Bears, slow down Dalvin Cook, yeah, you'll give up 20 points. That's it. Just score one offensive touchdown, you win. They can't do that. Cowboys, I don't care who their quarterback is. They're going to score an offensive touchdown. So if their defense can stifle Dalvin Cook at all, even just by predicting when they run the ball, which is going to be often, I mean, Cowboys should, should have a chance to cover this. I mean, and uh, the Cowboys-Steelers, was that typical Steelers showing up flat? Yeah, it, it was. Or but, or, or but was there some – Cowboys defense getting healthier. Van Der Esch back now for a couple mm -hmm. games. Easily the most important piece. I mean, no one wants to bet. Everyone wanted to bet the Cowboys for the first three, four, five weeks, even as they kept losing and losing and losing. People kept buying them, buying them, buying them. This is a clear, everyone's abandoned ship on the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. Coming off a buy, I mean, Mike McCarthy, like, he's not a good coach, but he's not built like – O'Brien. Nope. Yeah. Um, Patricia, no. And he's got like some pride. <laughs> you know, like. Well, no, well yeah. Uh, I, I mean, feel like well, this I mean, is and a Cowboys good technically, spot. Cowboys could technically win the division. So, like, there's. That's true. Like, like yeah, there's you can't not, be giving up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's. Yeah, I don't. The difference is the Vikings are like. And I think that, that's actually a great point. I mean, the, this is priced almost. Like, the Cowboys are so bad, they're out of the running, they're, like, in capitulation mode, it's time to move on, they're going to start putting in, like, backups and, like, ex experimenting with young players. Um, they're not going to be doing that. No, no. They were all in to, like, win the Super Bowl this year. So, like, I mean, yeah, they're going to try to win this game. I mean, they almost beat the Steelers. Steelers are undefeated, the best team in the NFL. I mean – no one expected that, you know, like I think it's a little overblown. I think the bad performance by the Cowboys recently were like, because of obvious issues, like their entire O line was out. They have a third string, fourth string quarterback, like things that are just like, yeah, you're going to suck. Like it's just going to happen. Kind of like jets last year. Like once D Darnold went out, they lost their two best defensive players. It was just like, you couldn't bet the jets until those players were healthy. But as soon as they were healthy, Jets went six and two versus the spread, you know? So the Cowboys getting healthy, like you can't lay the seven. Like that's just stupid. They're not, they're not three weeks ago, Cowboys. So I would strongly consider Cowboys. If, if I'm confident about the quarterback situation, which I'm not right now, I would, I would probably play it and just say, yeah, you know, I, what? I, mean, I actually wish they'd probably be playing Garrett Gilbert actually though, instead of Andy Dalton. Yeah. I liked uh, Gilbert. Um, looks like it's probably going to be Dalton, though. But I think, you know, looking to the offensive line, I mean, the offensive line's got to be getting healthier now. Uh, I know the defense definitely is getting healthier. So I think I think this is definitely a good buy sign on copper. I mean, you can't, you can't bet the Vikings in this situation. I mean, even if they cover and you win, like, I mean, <laughs> you're buying at all-time highs. Um, yeah yeah it's huge it's huge i don't know yeah it's again if if this game was three weeks ago i, I mean the, yeah by the by the vikings great spot well yeah because that's when cowboys were still in like yeah your and, and it was before it was before the vikings hit hit their high now 
I mean, this is top. I mean, All right, let's go much higher. Move on Titans plus five at the Ravens. So some pressure coming in on this line. I think this was six and a half, six. Now it's down to five. I'm People not going to abandoning ship on the Ravens now. So, so I can't bet this game personally. I am still on tilt from my Ravens fade macro view from last season. So anytime I'm involved with a Ravens game, my macro view says to fade them, but then I think I'm being too strong for that fade. So I can't – I don't have good judgment when it comes to Ravens games until the playoffs. Then I'm going to fade the shit out of them. But <laughs> as of right – If they make the playoffs. If they make the playoffs. I hope they don't. God, <laughs> I, I think I actually – did not – I wish we had – did we have on a podcast? I think I said that at one point. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't make the playoffs, but their schedule's easy. I don't know if I said that. I dreamed it. I think we did talk about that in the preseason. It was, first of all, just that their, their schedule is – it's so easy. I mean, they're not. They're going to the, make the playoffs. Especially in the second half. They are going to make yeah. the playoffs because if you look at the second half they're, of their slate, it's they're just going to run through it. It's like Bengals every week. Um, so uh, Ravens will definitely make the playoffs, unfortunately. Um, I think that it's a sinking – it is a sinking ship, though, because, uh, you know, we haven't really – pounded the table on it too much this year like we did last year mostly because we haven't been betting against the ravens as much as probably we should have been um yeah, that's a good point and, and i feel like that's the reason now you're, why now you're we, depressing me yeah well that's the reason why we don't feel as vindicated uh because we're not making money off this opinion uh and that's um from last year you know just talking about i think you know you put it in a really good uh, uh, you know, articulated it really well is that last year we were saying Ravens a gimmick, Ravens a gimmick, Ravens a gimmick. And, you know, it never fully, you know, I mean, it showed itself in the playoffs, which, you know, we felt like a sense of vindication there. But then over the off season, you know, there was plenty of handicappers out there. All, this Ravens team, like last year was like just the preview. They're going to be possibly the best team ever this year with a great defense, an unstoppable offense led by possibly one of the best quarterbacks that we've ever seen in the history of the NFL. All Mahomes versus Jackson is going to be, uh, you know, the next like two, like, uh, you know, head to head quarterback rivalries that we're going to see for the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah. Maybe you'll see Mahomes, not Jackson. This dude is, like slightly better than RG3. Like if you remember RG3 like had a great rookie year. I mean everyone thought that he was going to be amazing. And, and actually, again, this is still with a he great set a of coaching, great defense and I mean man, like Lamar Jackson just like he actually looks slower this year which I'm surprised by. So maybe he does have some underlying injury or something because one of the things we've talked about heavily over the off season and gotten to plenty of Twitter debates about was that one of the reasons why it's a gimmick is because the offense relies on Jackson's speed to such a great extent that, I mean, speed is the first thing to go when you're an athlete, you know, you'll still be able to throw the ball. You'll still be able to catch the ball. You know, you'll still have your, your mind, your brain, and then that should actually get better if you're an actually good quarterback or like someone, especially like Tom Brady. Um, you know, again, your acumen, your understanding of the game actually gets better as you get older. Um, but speed, if you rely on speed and that's like your main edge, you're going to lose that edge fast. Because speed in the NFL is, oh, someone's 4-3, someone's 4-4. Okay, well, the 4-3 guy is going to get around the edge. The 4-4 guy, the 4-5 guy, not going to get around the edge. And so instead of a getting around the edge and going 45 yards downfield, now it's a loss of two yards. And that's just like, that's when you talk about in the NFL, like, oh, it's a game of inches. Well, it's a game of inches, especially it's because of speed. And when you lose that edge, everything collapses. And Jackson, 
is, is lost a little bit of that speed this year. And, and he's definitely, I mean, just this is how life works. I mean, the dude's going to lose in the next two, three years. He's going to lose some of that speed. And that's why some of, you get these traditional quarterbacks, like someone like Tom Brady doesn't rely on speed whatsoever. <laughs> like that's not even a part of the game. So like he could be, get slower and slower and slower. It doesn't matter because it's not even a part of his edge, his edge, his, his decision-making, his ability to read the field, to find open receivers, to coach. And, you know, that's the types of quarterbacks could, that can last 20 years. Like we've seen with rivers and breeze and, and now Brady and Manning um, and, and players like Lamar Jackson are going to last for maybe five years. four or five maybe. years at max. Uh, and that's it. Yep. And then it's done. And then you're mm-hmm. on the bench and maybe, you know, he can be, uh, you know, like a Michael specialist. Player. Yeah, exactly. Actually, he'd be the perfect. Um, what's the Saints player name that everybody loves and hates? Yeah, Taysom Hill. Yeah, he's 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 Taysom Hill on on crack, I guess, and he's just he's fast as all can be, and he'll destroy you in the short term. Um, but it's just not it's not sustainable. It's it's a it's a very nice right hook, but there's no left jab. There's no uppercut. There's no kick to the balls even. There's nothing. There's just well, one the right hook. And it's not just like, oh, he's fast. He's got a great running game. The thing is the downstream effects of that is what made them so potent mm-hmm. last year was like the threat of that run opened up the passing game to the extent where you can find Mark Andrews open, wide open, mid in the middle of the field with like no one around him for like five, six yards. Like, well, okay, unless you're a complete – idiot you shouldn't you should be able to find him you know you suck in that defense and then you find these dudes wide open downfield that's not happening this year and if you're not gonna have that run game then you can't get the pass game and it's just all breaking down um that said the titans are not a great defense terrible defense <laughs> so uh bringing it back to this game so because again w- w- what we talk about all the time is we have macro views of, ga- of teams but they don't always play out on the micro sense in each individual matchup so we want to talk about that so uh, you know while we think the ravens are ultimately a sinking ship at least unless they get even more creative around game planning is this the right spot to fade them well, the trick is is also Ravens are dealing with like some serious like issues with COVID and injuries, so that's something to monitor. My issue in this game is I, I rewatched over the summer. I re rewatched the playoff game, and I was I went into it thinking that what happened did not actually happen. I thought the Titans dominated. They they actually didn't dominate. What really happened is. Ravens kind of like thought they could just like go for it and forth down every dime and get it. And like, yeah, they didn't get it. <laughs> like, and they got behind. And, and when they got behind, I don't know, you're screwed now because you don't have plan B. So it kind of just like got away from them, but like had like one or two plays in that first half gone for them. It very well might've just gone the exact opposite way. Cause it wasn't like the Titans defense was amazing or anything. Just like, you know, key fourth down stop type, type stuff is really kind of what changed the outcome um, and, the, and the game flow. So I don't know if that's going to happen again. It's really just if the Ravens were fully healthy, ready to go, I think this would be a good revenge spot that I wouldn't touch the Titans. My only concern is the, the Ravens kind of like losing some players on defense type thing. Um, and remember, they lost the, their, um, their offensive lineman, what, two weeks ago. He was a big loss. So – I don't – I can't bet the Ravens either because I am a big macro fader of the Ravens. and I don't want to lay six points with them. Like, this is is not the team last year. It's the whole narrative of, like, you can't lay too many points with the Ravens type thing. If if they win, they win by a lot. I I mean, they don't don't really win by a lot of margin anyways this year. So, I I don't – I don't love the spot on either team. And I'm on tilt with anything no, the Ravens I, I touch. Think, I don't think it's not true that they're not winning by margin. It's just they're just losing. So yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, that, that's the right. thing is 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 I, when they win, they beat the Colts by two touchdowns. 
So yeah. if they're going to win, they're going to cover. So, uh, the, and I think, so I think that narrative still holds. So if, if this game's going to be competitive, it's because the Titans are going to win. You bet tight. If you like plus Titans plus five, bet Titans money line. Just forget the plus five. You don't need it because uh, it's not going to come into play. Ravens are going to win this game by double digits or the Titans are going to win straight up. That's how it's going to play out. Yeah. Yeah. Probably right. It's fair. And, and, yeah, and in Baltimore, I mean, coming off a tough loss, I mean, I think the Ravens are starting to feel it a little bit now. Yeah, you obviously want to monitor the injury and the COVID components of that. One, one thing that's a little fishy about that game, though, is I think don't both teams play the division rival next week? Like Titans play the Colts and then Steelers play Ravens, I think. Or am I yeah. wrong? I, I don't uh, think this is a great look-ahead type spot thing, though, because, I mean, this is playoff, like, rematch – I think it's going to be quite meaningful, uh, possibly for playoff seating. I don't think this is like a look ahead type game. Uh, yeah, I think, well, I think the, the, Titans, the Titans definitely play Colts again next week. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow, Titans are plus four next week. That seems a little rich. Yeah, I kind of want to bet that. I, right I now. don't know which way I lean on this, but I mean. Like I said, it's it's either Ravens minus five or or Titans plus two oh five right now. No. All right, Packers, Colts, Packers one and a half on the road. So, you know, this line was plus three. Corey was banging the table. He he took it, he went ahead and took it in the uh, Beck Karma premium channel uh, at plus three. Now it's obviously got hammered down to one and a half. Who knows? Mike might, might keep going down. Um, it looks like by it's game time. To keep moving down to one. Yeah, so I, so a part of my hesitancy with this when Corey was pitching it, and he loved it like slam dunk, is the obvious. I do agree with on the macro, and I said it from the beginning of the season. This is going to be a revenge tour. The first eight to ten games for um, Aaron Rodgers, yeah, and you were dead right. Yeah, and he's he's played amazing except for like one or two games. So. Does that continue here? I do like a point I heard in a pod that Packers, like this is really their last real like difficult test, kind of like when they played the Bucks and we saw how they should have bed there. So like this is like a real test for them, but it is an AFC team. So like I'm kind of split on if that narrative really plays or not. And then also, so, you know, Colts have dominated the C North. So – I, I'm just not – you know, they're coming off that Thursday game so they had a little more time to prepare. But then again, they play the Titans next week, right? So, like, there's a lot of, like, split narratives that I'm having difficulty with this game. But a part of me thinks it could just be very simple, which is Aaron Rodgers not going to slip up again like he did versus Tampa. Like, Packers are going to put in a good performance now that they're getting healthier overall. Um and find a way to, to beat the Colts because they have a better quarterback, and then he's good to go. But the other side of me thinks this Colts defense keeps getting – people keep sleeping on. And Miles Leonard, as long as he's healthy, maybe one of the best linebackers in NFL, I mean, Colts might dominate this game just like the Bucks did. So, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm really kind of split, and I can't quite make a decision where I'm, I should lean. Talk to me. Talk me into something or off something. <laughs> Which way do you think I'm leaning? Because I'm not split. I actually, I actually don't really see the other side. In fact, so I could be wrong then. But which way? I you think, think you're on the Colts. Yeah, I, I like the Colts. Uh, so th- this is part of the reasons why is I thought you had a very uh, compelling prediction around Rogers' revenge tour the first half of the season. So now we're moving in the, in the second half of the season, and even towards the first the second half of the first half of the season, we started to see cracks in the Packers. So Bucks, Vikings, Jags, three games in the last five weeks where they've showed some cracks here. Now they beat up on the Texans, a badly coached team. They beat up on the Niners on Thursday night, uh, which I mean, I'm sure they took great pride in that after getting Absolutely, their throat slit uh, by the Niners 
uh, the, uh, twice last year um, and, and beat up on a, a Niners team that was, you know, completely broken, uh, bleeding out in the streets. Uh, the Colts is not that. Colts are getting healthier. Colts are well coached. Colts are at home. Uh, Colts uh, are competent team. And I just think, you know, these bewildering performances, I mean, you almost really, you can, even when you try to reverse engineer what went, 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 what went wrong for the Packers in the Bucks game, in the Vikings game, in the Jaguars game, it's almost like what we saw you know, from the Packers last season when it was like, man, this is like the worst 13 and three team we've ever seen because, you know, like there's all these games they should be losing. And, you know, they just haven't been as dominant the last three to four weeks. I think this is the best team that they've played since the Bucks. Um, and... I think the line is not giving the Colts any respect at, okay. at minus one. Um, and I'm, I'm surprised by the line movement. I think like the, the mark, I don't know what side the public's necessarily on, but I mean, they're not going to be on the Colts. Well, see, th this is the thing is, is, and this is one thing I wanted to talk to you about too. And I would love to back test this and things like this. When, when you see a team, okay get a lot of sharp love, like discernible, demonstrable, sharp love, then how, and maybe it doesn't play out, but that was a signal that said like, Hey, like there's meaningful money on this team and maybe it doesn't play out that week, but that doesn't mean that that isn't a signal for this team moving forward. And if you remember mm -hmm. Colts Ravens, that was like a very bewildering line movement. I mean, the Colts were plus three and that moved all the way through pick to Colts minus one with mm -hmm. the public pounding the Ravens. Now the Ravens ended up winning that game covering, but it was closer than the final score showed. The Colts played competitively and, and a few mistakes here or there, maybe they win and cover that game. Um, and then we see the next week, Colts win decisively versus the Titans. Now, it's like, I just feel like when you see that type of line movement on a team, like, like does it have foresight into, you know, like, oh, there was, there was so much money supporting a particular side or fading a particular side. Does that have ramifications downstream for that team? You know, like I think another really good example was remember maybe four or five weeks ago now, uh, uh, Seahawks, Niners, money pouring in on the Niners, ostensibly not really on the Niners, but fading Seahawks. Hey, mm. and, th and that didn't play out. But that was really bizarre line movement uh, with the public pounding the Seahawks. We were on the Seahawks. We ended up winning it. Uh, it was definitely a square side, but since that game, I mean, the, the Seahawks have not played well. No, they've, that was actually probably their last really good game. Yeah. And so I just wonder when you think about it, like when you see these really bizarre line moves, again, when you can detect, all right, there's a massive amount of money behind a particular team. And especially if it doesn't play out in that event, does that mean that that money was supporting that team just there? That's it. Or was that money moving in the direction of a particular team, basically in anticipation that like, this is a team that is bet on kind of like for the next couple of weeks at minimum. And like, that is just a signal that I feel like is, is, could be interesting and meaningful. And something I definitely want to look at more so in the off season, but say there is some merit to that. That means the Colts are by on here. Colts are by on here. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, and I, I agree with all that. I, I leaned, the reason I was, I mean, I hesitated heavily at green Bay plus three. So like I'm, I'm to a point where like, 
it's very hard for me to like Green Bay plus one and a half, um, which makes me think I should be on the Colts. My hesitancy with the Colts, besides the whole like Rogers revenge door crap, is, you know, I don't know how meaningful this game really is to either team. True. Like, and I think Alan from, from, Lazard because, you know, what's that for what's that that's worth? Well, Alan Lazard, Lazard's back. Like, like from a structural standpoint, like Green Bay's two games ahead of Chicago, like they know they're not going to lose the North. They play the Bears, like they're not going to lose the North. You know, Colts, I mean, they literally play Titans the next week, which will decide the division. Like, Titans are playing Baltimore, probably lose based on the line. Colts, if they lost, like, does it doesn't matter? Like, for both these teams, I don't know if this game actually even matters. Like, if I was both these coaches, I might just be like, eh, let's just, like, get COVID and call it off. Like, let's just tell the league we all have COVID. Let's cancel the game. Who gives a shit? Like, it's, it's like, it's a cross conference. So, I'm just a little concerned that this is a dead spot for either team or both teams, which makes me, like, not love either side. So, just throwing that out there. Yeah, no, that, that, that's fair. And like I mentioned, Alan Lazard is coming back for the Packers. So I think, as you mentioned earlier, Packers are getting healthier. Um, I probably still do, even taking all that into consideration, still do lean Colts. The thing is, you can't really trust Rivers too much. Um, I mean, again, I don't know if this is a top five pick, but and I can see Corey's – allure to Packers plus three I feel like that has push potential um but I'm still gonna lean Colts here I mean uh again like the Packers mean lose to the Vikings beat up on a beat up Niners team barely squeak one out versus the Jags I mean I understand like maybe it was just like a dead spot so maybe you don't want to read too much into it but I feel like if the Packers were still humming, this was a nice spot. Just crush the Jags and move on. Um, and well, I, I did. I did. Struggle. Well, I do think this. It might have been the Jags, um, like just because the weather was so poor that they just kind of had a vanilla game script playing the Jags. Um, so that could have been part of the issue. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's true, and this will be ideal circumstances uh in uh half of a dome which i'm sure will be closed but uh for indianapolis so uh yeah that's that's definitely a fair point so weather will not be a factor in this one and maybe weather was more so a factor definitely i mean it definitely was a factor in jags was a factor in vikings um so that's definitely a fair point all right so let's move on uh let's just spend 30 seconds on this one just real quick so Steelers on the road versus Jags Jags are plus 10 and a half uh just which way do you lean you know 10 seconds um uh, it's such a big line I, I can't do the Jags quarterback versus the Steelers defense even though it's a dead spot for the Steelers um but again now Steelers are through that kind of like are they 10 and 0 now 11 and 10 and 0 I know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, this team might be past that point of like, we can go undefeated. We could be the best team ever, like in their minds. So I, I like they had their flat spot versus Cowboys. They're playing, I think, an even worse team. So if, Lut- if Minshew's quarterback, I would lean Jags taking the points. If Lutton's the quarterback, I don't know how he's going to fare against that Steelers front. Like he could get four turnovers. Um, so yeah, I, I just can't, I would tease the Steelers probably and just take seven or, you know, plus minus three and a half or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wonder what the status is. It says he won't be ready for a Steelers game. So it will be looting. Oh, okay. Um, I, I feel like this, <sighs> I mean, the Steelers, <laughs> the Steelers uh, put in dead spots multiple times in the season. Like they've been known to put in mul- It's not just yes, one. That is, that is true. Uh, so I, I definitely lean Jags here. Probably not going to be a, a top five pick because it's, it's either you're going to get a Cowboys type performance or you're going to get a Bengals type performance where it's like 
clearly cover and not decisive or clearly don't cover and not decisive. So, um, uh, you know, I don't think there's, there's much edge. So last game, Rams at Bucks. It's currently four. That, that's the last game that's up. And, and real quick, the uh, Lions-Panthers game that is currently off the board and Chiefs-Raiders, which is off the board, um, yes. just FYI. But yeah, Rams, Bucks. So I bet the Bucks minus three already. Um, so obviously I'm on the Bucks. I'm ten and zero on the Bucks this season as far as predicting the side that you should be on. Bucks whisper. Bucks whisper is what they call me, and the reason is is because I grew up a Bucks fan, but since I started betting about eight years ago, I stopped being a fan. So I have a pretty good like understanding of the team, the culture, the players, but don't have that kind of fan loyalty. So, I'm the Bucks whisperer. <laughs> At three, I love the Bucks. Three and a half, I would still bet the Bucks. Four, I'm getting a little more hesitant. I'm just gonna be honest right now. Um, but I think I shouldn't be hesitant because the handicap is basically. I mean, it's there's a lot of layers to it. But the first and foremost, the Rams do not match up well versus the Bucks. The Bucks have to have another poor performance on late night television to have the Rams kind of like be in this game and win this game or have a chance to win this game. And the good thing is Arians is making the Bucks two practices leading up to the game at nighttime, like getting them conditioned because he, he, you know, having the energy up and ready to go and Rams by the time this game starts, you know, I mean, their body clocks are adjusted to a different time period. It'll be earlier, but it's just, I don't know. There's a lot, you know, Rams are what fifth travel to the East coast in their last six weeks or something. Like there's just so many variables that go in the favor of the bucks in this game. Well, and the Rams defeat of Seattle was not impressive. No, they're the Rams offense has been under performing all season. I mean, in that, like that is what they are. They're just, they relied on the run game. That's not very good. Jared Goff does not throw deep down the field. Goff, so listen, Goff on the road versus a team that's going to put pressure on him in prime time. The only variable we're missing from this being a slam dunk play is the Rams being favorited. But I'll take those variables on my side. I think... Obviously, I love Bucks minus three. Bucks minus four, I still like. I mean, because again, well, remember what we were talking about earlier this weekend is if your conviction changes dramatically by shifting it one or two points, is your conviction even that strong? And it yeah. sounds like you had a lot of conviction at Bucks minus three. And if that is the case, I mean, you should ostensibly like this team up to six. Yeah, well, that's actually interesting you say that because I, I think this line should be a, a, a beat about six, like if not even six and a half, seven. So I think this line is built off perceptions that have been wrong all season about the Bucks. The market has always been a game behind of, oh, the Bucks are really good to, oh, the Bucks are really terrible. Well, like, like we're, they're, we're they're... Bucks minus five and a half. This same situation versus the Saints. And, and the, the Saints, Saints are much better than the Rams. A hundred percent. So you're basically proving my point. And, and it's, the reason I'm the Bucks whisperer is only because the market is always a week late on the Bucks, And I'm on the Bucks like what they should be every week. I'm with the Bucks rhythm, the market's off the rhythm. That's all that's happening. So it's not like I'm special. It's just that. Well, and that's how you make money, in fact. Yes. So, so the rhythm is, this is the Bucks week. And, and again, part of that, what's even a clearer signal, is the coaching, right, the most important part of the game, realizes that their rhythm is off in night games. So they're actually working to do something different to address it, which is a positive. So... I, there's just this game just stacks so heavily in the Bucks' favor as far as signals that like obviously can't take the Rams. Um, yeah, I, I think you gotta like the Bucks 
anything under six, I, I mean, to me, I said that from the beginning when it was three. I was just like, eh, yeah. I hate losing points, but at the same time, that's just like a fundamental thing. Like, but for this specific game, it's not going to matter. If, they, if the handicap's right, it's not going to matter. Jared Goff's going to struggle at times. Brady's going to find ways to, you know, get the ball in the end zone. Bucks 28, Rams 17 type thing. Mm-hmm. Well, and again, this is the third week now of having Antonio Brown. I mean, there was cappers out there pricing mm-hmm. in Brown as a meaningful variable in week one versus that in, in the Saints. So, and we totally disagree with that narrative. Uh, but his value is going to, I think we can agree that at least incrementally increase as time passes. And I think his value is going to be more in this game than it was in the Saints. I'll say that. I 100% agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Do we, do we want to mention real quick anything about the Panthers-Lions? Um, I mean, I guess I, will I, say I if, slightly if lean the Panthers. I, the one thing I was saying, like, it depends on Bridgewater's status, but even yeah. if they have P.J. Walker, I mean, you know he played – well in the AFL Um, and one of the things we talked about over the course of the week was how the distinction between like our early season success last year when we were like 13 and 2 to start the season uh, and then started to to waver was not just some sort of like uh, you know de-evolution of handicapping skill that wasn't it it was actually just fear it was conservatism and because in the beginning of the season uh, we had no fear in betting quarterbacks that started to play for the very first time um especially if the situation was right and uh you know and that kind of handicapping would have worked out this season as well but it's something that we haven't really done too much and there's so many times you just need to hold your nose and just make a play and I don't know if PJ Walker, I mean, the decision-making is, is massive. So like Bridgewater doesn't make mistakes. PJ Walker probably could make mistakes. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I'm not saying like, I want to pound the table on, on Panthers by any means. Cause usually in those instances that I mentioned, at least when we're talking about playing these kind of no name backup quarterbacks that come in, we're getting like, a massive amount of points. And at least in, 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 cause even if you bet Jake Luton, you bet Jake Luton versus the Texans, you're getting six and a half points. You bet Jake Luton versus the Packers, you're getting, you know, almost two touchdowns. Um, if we're going to bet PJ Walker here, you know, we're laying, you know, we're going to be a one and a half point uh, favorite. So that, so that is, that is different. Um, Good point. That is, yeah, so that, that, is, that is different. And, and the word on the street is Galladay might be back. So if Stafford and Galladay are back versus that Panthers defense, even if Bridgewater plays, I, I don't think I could take Panthers in that spot. If, if Bridgewater plays, I like the Panthers. That's fair. I mean, I understand why I, I, I would say a little bit on P.J. Walker and then betting him as a favorite uh, is just the uh, – not in rhythm and also the mistakes, the mistakes that can come with that. Uh, but, you know, let's not forget, I mean, the Panthers were beating the Bucks. They were playing the Bucks competitively for half that game. And then it got away from them, which is fair. Uh, but the Panthers have pretty much been played competitive football versus everyone that they've played for at least like there there's been no game like a Jets type game or even a Bengals versus Steelers type game where like they lost and they're like out of it right from the very beginning and it's kind of just like a game that you don't even watch um and now they're playing the Lions who I think you've mentioned before I think actually this is a really really uh prescient observation I think you were talking about in last week's podcast was hey, the Lions could be up two touchdowns versus Washington. And that's not enough for, you know, um, <laughs> and that's exactly was the case. Um, and I think that the same thing here. I mean, Lions could take advantage of the Panthers defense 
early on in the game. But this is another coaching mismatch. I mean, the, the Panthers coaching staff is, you know, much more creative, much more adaptable. And, you know, on the Lions side is just full of vulnerability. Uh, so yeah, I, that's a very good point. Actually, with, with less talent, the Panthers defense has done more than the Lions defense, it seems like. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm not quantifying that. I'm just saying it's, it appears to be so. Absolutely. So. And then Chiefs Raiders, this line moved from six and a half to what eight and a half now. Yeah, kind of I, I got I got a view on this team. I mean, I, on this game. I mean, again, like there's so much COVID stuff going on. It's like hard to say, but I mean, I don't know how much worse can the Raiders defense get. So I well, mean, they actually played pretty well versus bad. the Broncos. Yeah, it's it's a bad. I mean, it's it's yeah, just I mean, the Raiders defense. It's just the Raiders defense is bad. So if you lose those players, I don't know how much worse it's necessarily going to get. The Raiders are one of those teams that, I mean, they're six and three. I mean, they beat the Chiefs. They've uh, beat the Saints. Uh, they trounced the Broncos last, uh, last week. Um, you know, I mean, they've won obviously numerous yeah. games. They've- uh, I'll, say, I'll say this. If you, I mean, you can take the Chiefs. You could probably tease. I would if the Chiefs are under nine. Just go ahead and tease them down to like one, one and a half. Like you might as well just do it. Like Chiefs are not going to lose this game unless Mahomes somehow gets hurt or something. It's just they're they're not. Raiders are not going to be able to stop the Chiefs. Is is my main point. Like Chiefs are in a motivated spot. This is like probably the last game the Chiefs really give a shit about for the rest of the season. So until the playoffs start, there's no way in hell. It doesn't matter what the number is that you can back the Raiders here. I, I mean, if you want, if you want to get creative, alt line the Chiefs, like do whatever you want, but like lean towards the Chiefs direction because you can't play the Raiders here. Ra- yeah, Raiders yeah. are f- a faulty six and three as well. They're 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 better than people think, but they're not. There's no way they can win the AFC. Like that's just not going to happen. So, and again, if, if, if they play the Saints and Chiefs more than once, which they play the Chiefs more than once, do they, do they beat the Saints the second time, the third time, the fourth? Like, how many times do they actually beat the Saints if you replay that game? So, I, yeah, I just think this is, Chiefs are off. If you can get it down to under seven, I think you got to take the Chiefs. Yeah, I, I mean, I just think that my point around that was that – I mean, even going into last week, I mean, the, the, the Raiders were sold all the way down to minus three uh, by kickoff. It's just the market, um, the market doesn't care what their record is, completely discounts it, completely discounts pretty much anything positive that the Raiders ever do um, as if it didn't happen. Um, and you kind of keep getting l- relative line value. Um, I mean, what, they're at home plus more than a touchdown versus a team yeah. to eat. I, everyone's going to – and the thing is, no one's taking that into consideration because everyone's fading that. Everybody's going to be on the Chiefs. Everyone's going to be on the Chiefs. So it's not like people are overvaluing these tor- sorts of things. The thing is, is I just don't think this game's bettable because there's too much COVID stuff going on. It just seems too easy to say the Colts are probably just – I mean, the Chiefs are going to crush them. Uh, because they're going to have no defense. Maybe that does happen, and maybe it does, and the public makes a shit ton of money. I'm not going to be making any money on this game. <laughs> I like the way you put that. <laughs> All righty. So that wraps up uh, this week's podcast, uh, breaking down uh, our performance from week 10 and looking ahead to, to week 11, still outperforming our benchmark. Aggressive had a positive week, core slightly down after a nice four to five win. Uh, four to five week winning streak. Look back uh, uh, to to bounce back uh, this week uh, and continue to uh, outperform our benchmark. We're up six six units, up ten units in aggressive. Uh, so looking to continue that momentum in week eleven. Uh, so we'll chat with you next week. Uh, take care, everyone. And that's the closing bell.